Hi, and welcome to the end of the week webinar for this week. I've got a really good, uh, in fact, one of my oldest friends in the United States, um, he was one of the first people I ever met when I came to the United States uh, 20 years ago, uh, Mike Vincent. Mike, how are you today? I'm good, mate. Yeah, making me feel old, but <laughs> lovely, lovely <laughs> to see you. Well, uh, before we, we dive into to Mike and his um, his webinar today, just a reminder for those people that are listening in um, to to the webinar, you'll have a um, an opportunity to write questions. I know a couple of you are already on there. You'll have an opportunity to write questions on that uh, control panel you have, and then we'll we'll start asking those questions to Mike as we go along. But uh, don't don't forget to write those questions in. So, Mike, we're at the end of the week. I'm quite excited about having this one. Uh, we don't get to see each other too often we're, with our crazy busy lives but why don't you for the people that don't know who you are um, or haven't heard of you too much why don't you give them an intro and a bit of a journey of how you got to where you are now okay um, well I've been in in the states now for, for 26 years which is obviously you know quite a long time a significant amount of time um, uh, I left England I emigrated from England to the states at age 26 so funny enough this summer will be exactly I've, I've ha half of my life in England and, and half in this country now so that's kind of a big landmark but um, you know like yourself and a lot of the the coaches here and I know some of the coaches that you've had on on your webinars and I grew up in England I grew up in Oxford um, in the in the 70s and 80s so it's going back a, a while now um, Soccer there obviously was and always has been an incredible uh, cultural uh, country. The soccer culture is is incredibly incredibly pervasive. Uh, it's 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 huge. You know, just like in Brazil or Germany or you know countries like that. Um, the whole soccer structure there, the youth soccer structure, was very very different from from what it is now in England and certainly what it is here in the in the states. Uh, in the uh, youth club soccer wasn't really the main uh, form of youth soccer then. It existed, it was there, of course it was. Uh, soccer as a professional spectator sport was huge. It was massive in the 70s and 80s and anybody growing up in that era or knowing about it would be familiar with that, of course. But really, school soccer was where, where it was at at that point. Uh, so I, I started playing soccer when I was four years old, I think. Um, you know, fell in love with the game straight away. You know, always wanted to be a, a professional soccer player. That was my goal uh, growing up. Uh, and I played, you know, did play play some club soccer a little bit. But as I said, it wasn't really the, the club game. It was a school game. So I, I played throughout my school career. Uh, and, and one of the differences there was that there wasn't the specialization in soccer that there is now uh, in England and, and certainly in this country. So growing up uh, within the school infrastructure and, and, and playing sports there, I played the whole spectrum of sports. I played soccer, um, rugby, cricket, uh, tennis, uh, athletics, track and field, as we call it in the States, um, basketball. And when I was a little bit older in, in high school, I actually became pretty immersed in field hockey, believe it or not, because field hockey is a, is a huge sport in, in England and Europe and countries like Australia and South Africa. So it was a, that was a big deal to me too. But, but really, the school, the school soccer system was where it was at. And there weren't the opportunities or specialization in England uh, at that time. And, and I don't think that changed. Uh, you may recall this, you might remember this, but I don't think that changed until uh, 1997. I want to say I would have been about, about 30 years old at that point. So this was long after I'd left school. Uh, and that was when Howard Wilkinson, who was the, the Football Association technical director at that time, introduced what was called the Charter for Quality uh, to improve uh, soccer uh, in England. And the two biggest developments within the charter for quality was that number one, kids could actually be affiliated with professional club academies in England at the age of nine, as opposed to 14, which is what it had been at the time. Uh, and the second big development was that they could, uh, they could uh, practice and be coached at uh, professional academies, club academies uh, for up to five hours a week, as opposed to one hour a week. So that was a huge, a huge development. Uh, the Charter for Quality, and it completely it completely changed the emphasis uh, on school soccer going to club soccer, if you like, and the opportunities that, that arose from that. So, um, I, you know, I, I played the whole spectrum of sports. When I got to about 16, 17 years old, uh, I realized that I did have, I guess, some talent for soccer. Uh, I, I played for my, my county team, which was Oxfordshire, 
Um, and I was sharing a story with you earlier on before we came came on, on air here. But and it's the funniest story because it wouldn't happen. It just wouldn't happen these days, I don't think. But one day I was just playing in a local park with some friends, uh, and a, a guy was watching us play. He was just walking his dog, and he came up to me and said, "Would I like to have a trial for Oxford United, which was the professional team at that time? This was going back to about uh, 1985, something like that." And Oxford were in the equivalent of the Premier Division at the time. So they had a good team. They had a lot of good players like John Aldridge and Ray Houghton that went on to play for the likes of Liverpool. You know, you'll remember those guys. You know, a bunch of other good players too. And he asked if I wanted to go for a trial, a tryout with, with, the, with Oxford, the local pro team. And I, I thought he was joking. I thought he was just winding me up. And, and uh, <laughs> it turned out that a couple of weeks later, uh, some of the Oxford United coaches, they showed up at my school and they watched me and another lad and we went over to Oxford United uh, and we served a very brief uh, apprenticeship there because I realised that you know, I was okay, but I wasn't at that level. So um, that took me through to about the age of 18. And at the age of 18, I, I really didn't have a clue what I wanted to do. Um, I, I went to work for a bank, uh, which I really disliked a tremendous amount. And, uh, and I played non-league or semi-professional soccer for a team called Abingdon United that played in the, the English Hellenic League. I think at the time they would have been in like tier seven, maybe. So Premier League would be top and then you could answer. It would be like, like division seven, if you like. Uh, and I did that for, I think, two to three years playing semi-pro soccer uh, for Abingdon um, and working in the bank. And it was a good fit because my evenings and weekends were free to do that. I was getting paid a little bit of money to, to play, not much, a nominal amount, but that was great at the time. But I really, really wanted to, um, to, to be involved more with soccer. And I knew that if I couldn't make it as a pro, that perhaps the next best thing would be to, to coach the game. Um, and so I started taking some of the qualifications in England, as it was then, the English preliminary license. I took that. Uh, I went on a couple of courses uh, for the, the full badge, the preparatory courses for the full badge, as it was called then. This was way before the UEFA, UEFA B and A licenses uh, came into play. Uh, and it actually gave me a lot of confidence because a lot of the guys that were, that were on the preparatory courses for the full badge, which was the highest coaching qualification you could get at that time, were ex-pros. And although they were very, very good players, of course, um, they weren't necessarily the best coaches. They weren't necessarily the best communicators. And I thought, well, I can do this. I can coach better than these guys or as well as, as, as a lot of these guys. And there were some very good ones. But, but there was a big difference between you know, just being able to play the game and to be able to, to, to teach it and relate what you wanted to, to, to relate and how you wanted to do it to, to players of, of different ages and abilities. So uh, I, I did that. And then, and then one day my life changed completely. Uh, I happened to look in a, a, a local newspaper article. And the newspaper article... Uh, I think I was 21 at the time, newspaper article, the Oxford Mail, and it talked about a coaching opportunity in uh, the United States of America with a company called, at the time, British Soccer, uh, now Challenger Sports, or British Soccer is a, subsidi a subsidiary of Challenger Sports, um, in, based out of Kansas City, and they were looking for coaches. So I got my prelim uh, coaching award. That was all it was at the time, but all I had. Um, that summer, went out to, uh, to, um, to Kansas City um, at age 21, and that, that, uh, that started, or that was probably one of the best periods of my life, for, without any shadow of a doubt. Uh, stayed out that summer. We went to a different uh, community, to a different state every week. You'll obviously you know, know about this, because late, later on when I met you, we'll talk about that in a minute, you were working for Challenger, uh, you know, which was great. But we went to a different uh, different town uh, every single every single week. We'd spend the weekends driving in a little Reliant <laughs> Robin car full, filled with about 80 soccer balls deflated in the back of the car, and we travel from you know from Kansas to, to Texas to Oklahoma to Tennessee to Michigan to Nebraska to Iowa, and it was fantastic. It was all a great adventure. Uh, we got to do something that we love to do to coach coach kids, young 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 people. The, most of the players were predominantly recreational players, um, but there were some some club players and teams there as well. Um, and it was just a fantastic adventure. And, and, and when I finished that summer, I knew two things. I knew that I wanted to to, to have a career in, in coaching, and I knew that uh, I would really like for it to be in, in America, in the United States. So my boss at the time, uh, the two guys that really uh, were very, very influential you know, for me at that time, one was Peter Arch. 
uh, and the other was Alan Jones, uh, and they were kind of you know spearheading the company at that time. Um, and um, you know, they're, they're still very involved in soccer in this country. Uh, and, and Alan said to me, you know, if you want to do this, you've got to go, really, you've got to go get a degree. Wasn't something that I thought about at that time. So I went back to England. Uh, I managed to, um, to get on a, a bachelor's degree course. Uh, and I did a double major in, in sports studies, uh, which was essentially all aspects of sport, kinesiology, biomechanics, uh, sports sociology, the history of sport, sports psychology. Um, I specialized in sports psychology. That was really uh, my main theme within that course. And then the, the other major I did was American studies, which was great because it, it complemented coming to America every summer very well. And that was American uh, politics, American history, uh, communities, uh, popular culture, literature, the whole, the whole work. So it was a really, really good combination for me. It allowed me to go back to England for the, the school year and, and uh, get a bachelor's degree, uh, which I did, uh, along with my teaching certification in physical education, because I wanted to do that too, uh, and then come out every summer uh, in between to work for Challenger Sports and do the soccer camps, which was great. Uh, and then when I finished my degree, um, I was offered a full-time job with Challenger as the Southwest area um, manager um, or representative for the company. I was based initially out of Tulsa, Oklahoma. I remember sitting on the plane at Heathrow, um, just you know, the day that I emigrated, thinking, what the heck am I doing? I've got no idea. I'm just going to go to Tulsa, Oklahoma. I've been told to find somewhere to live in Tulsa, get a car, get a social security card, um, set up a, a coaching academy. I had no idea. It was, it was a, a huge leap of faith, um, but it was a tremendous adventure, and it was just absolutely brilliant. So. That's what I did. So I came out. I worked as a Southwest Area Manager for Challenger Sports. Um, we, uh, I, I, oversaw, I oversaw, uh, oversaw the region of, of Texas, Oklahoma. I think it was Colorado, Arkansas, New Mexico. Got to travel a lot within within that area. Set up probably between two and three hundred camps in that region. Uh, we became the most profitable region with the most kids attending camps, and it gave me the opportunity to meet some fantastic coaches um, like yourself. Um, guys that you've had on your webinars uh, already recently, Phil Roscoe, who's now at Liverpool's Academy, of course, Stuart Sharp, that you'd, uh, I think you'd uh, chatted mm -hmm. with a couple of days ago, that's the, the head coach of the US Paralympic team. Um, Richie Rogers, you probably remember him. Richie mm -hmm. went on to become, uh, for a, a period of time, the head coach of the Leicester City women's soccer team. Um, Mel Davis, who went to, to coach with, with Cardiff City. Um, and, you know, Richie Smith, of course, can't forget Richie that has his own, you know, successful club here in North Texas now. So a lot of great coaches. Uh, I did that for 10 years. Absolutely loved it um, until the job became, I, I guess, more sales based than anything else. And, and I realized at that time I wanted to kind of not be quite so concerned with um, sales and, and the, the logistics of doing so. Um, selling apparel, that type of thing, wasn't really my thing. And I wanted to get back more to co coach and player development. So at that time, uh, I think after 10 years with the company, I was very fortunate to to um, to meet the athletic director of a, of a school here in Fort Worth, Texas, um, called Fort Worth Country Day School. Uh, the athletic director at the time uh, offered me a position at the school as the, um, the, the soccer program director at the school. It's a K through 12 uh, college preparatory school it's probably one of the top well it is one of the top college preparatory schools in the whole country uh and i've been there now for um 17 years believe it or not uh and i uh, i coach the, the boys um varsity soccer team and i oversee the whole soccer program you know for the boys k through 12 um you know on more of an all-year-round basis so that kind of takes us through to um to, <laughs> to where i am now long story but uh that's that's where I am, and along the way, along the way, um, I was fortunate enough to to do a lot of the coaching, you know, qualifications that we've done. Um, I, I managed to get my, my A license and uh, the NSCAA International Premier Diploma and, and things like that. So done a lot of lot of coaching courses over the years. Um, I've been a, a staff instructor for the Oklahoma State Soccer Association and and also uh, the North Texas State Soccer Soccer Association and an ODP coach at times over the years. So uh, it's been great. And, and I love doing the coach education.
because it's given me an opportunity to do a lot of the instruct on a lot of the courses like the the D license and the, the E and the F and the G and stuff like that and, and also the the NSCAA NSCAA courses as they were then. Yeah, United Soccer Coaches. So um so uh, an extensive background um for those that are listening here you know and I met Mike he was my boss pretty much um when I came over in the early 2000s 2001 to 2000 2001 and I guess you left Challenger Sports at that point 2002 I think you left I think that was the last uh, summer two, I seen yeah, yeah 2000 2002 2003 yeah yeah but um at that point also you were involved in in the club soccer scene in, in Fort Worth as well quite heavily um director of Fort Worth um football club as well right did that for a while yeah with Fort Worth FC I was with them for for many years and you know we had some very um very good memories of that time. Um, some real good teams. I was predominantly coaching boys teams, to be honest. Uh, we had a very, very successful um, 86 age group team, 1986 birth year, and then also 1988 birth year. Uh, very good teams that at the time were playing in um, Classic League, Division One of Classic League. This was before the days of DA and ECNL. So at that time, you know, the Classic League players really did represent i think you know mm -hmm. the, the top players around you know for their age in, in each age group but yeah it was good good teams um even went over to england and we did some tours of england um we played some very good teams we were we beat crystal palace's youth team uh on one occasion one year and i think they were very upset by that and then the year after we played them again and then they, then they stuffed us five up <laughs> yeah so should have should have probably quit we were ahead and in, in that that first time we played and i think we beat them three one we had three shots in in 90 minutes and i think they had about 33 and we we, we managed to score the three shots we had so i think um, there's a bit of a snobbery between sometimes american teams coming over which is yeah. certainly the gap's been closed in that that's for sure yeah um, absolutely absolutely so you did that then, just, yeah sorry just interrupt with that so uh, we do have a question that's come in but we're not going to ask that question so keep writing those questions in but some of those will will ask towards the later of the of the um, webinar here because it just doesn't fit in right now so keep writing those questions in and we'll come back to those in a bit okay so paddy has just written one we'll get to that later it's not going to make any sense right now okay so yeah so you're in the youth program so so now of course with your own boy i know you had a break there between the with the youth you've got your own boy um that's now growing up and, and is enjoying the same um the same level of excitement of soccer as you you have um so you got back into coaching um with luke yep. and, yep, uh, and now with, with him yeah and now and now coach with solar um so love love the club uh a lot of really good direction and leadership in the club uh you know which i enjoy a lot very well organized, well structured, um, you know, group of coaches. Um, and so, yeah, I coach, uh, I coach his uh, U13, 2007 age group team. We play, we play in Classic League, we're in, we're in D2 of Classic League right now. But uh, we're a pretty competitive team. Um, I think on our day, we're, you know, probably in the top 10, 10 or so maybe teams in, in North Texas for our age group. So that's a lot of fun, uh, you know, do that now. And and obviously, the biggest challenge that we have right now with with the the enforced break that we're all we're all taking is is you know what are the kids doing? What are our players doing? You know what are our teams doing? And how are they doing it um, in these very challenging circumstances with what limited resources we really do have right now? Well, and that brings us on to the next point here. So, considering the individual player development. Why do you think it is so challenging at this present time and in the in the new norms that we're in right now? Yeah, I think um, I think a lot of it stems from the kind of uh, the the American youth sports culture psyche, if you like, and the extent to which sports in America are so organised and structured. And whilst that can be a good thing at times, you know, I always I've always felt and still do that there, there needs to be more of a balance really between um, between that level of organization and structure and allowing kids to play freely uh, and allowing them to make their own decisions and, and, and make their own mistakes. And I think that soccer has become so structured in this country that there are practices on certain days, at certain evenings, at certain times. And the whole concept of free play is very, very foreign to a lot of the kids. So now that they're faced with this um, dilemma, if you like, and this challenge of um, you know, we can't play, we can't see our teammates, we can't interact socially with our teammates, then, then you know, how do we do this? Uh, you know, how do, we, how do we play? How do we practice? And it's very foreign to them. 
and it's very, very foreign to them and it's something that they're not accustomed to doing. But I think that we need to treat this time as an opportunity for them to uh, become more creative uh, with what they do, um, to develop their, their, their coping skills and coping me mechanisms, if you like, um, and to, to, be, to become creative about the things that they do and the things that they practice. And I think there's certainly ways of doing that. Um, you know, I'll be honest with you, using my own son as an example, I don't think he's particularly representative of the vast majority of kids out. And I say that because I'm a coach like you are and like a lot of the, you know, the, the guys and, and ladies listening to this webinar are as well. But, you know, I have an abundance of soccer balls. I have hurdles. I have hoops. I have uh, ladders for ladder work. Um, I've got um, portable goals. I've got pug goals. You know, we have all that type of equipment. And, you know, my son is fortunate enough that he can use those things if he wants to. He doesn't do that near as much as I'd like him to still. Mm -hmm. um, that's for sure. Um, but, uh, you know, we're very fortunate in that regard. And I would say that the, I, I contend that the vast majority of kids um, that are in, in, in this situation now, they don't have access to those sorts of resources. It might literally be that it is just them. They have one soccer ball, maybe maybe two or three soccer balls at the most. And, and very little equipment uh, to use. So I think there's ways that we can that we can tackle this and help them to uh, to become far more creative in their in their thought processes when practicing. Absolutely. So why don't we get into that and break down those developments that we can you would consider to be important? Um, why don't we talk a little bit about that? Okay. So what what I what I've tried to do with my team uh, and what, you know, what I like to do is I've tried to break the, the game down into four components, the technical, the tactical, the physical and the psychological. So starting with the technical, I think for sure right now with the limited resources that the players do have, uh, and let's just make the assumption that it's just them. They don't have anybody else to play with. Maybe mum and dad are busy, you know, working, they've got other things. Maybe they don't have siblings at all. If they do have siblings, then perhaps they're not a similar age or they don't share the same soccer interest. So they're on their own and they've just got a ball. So technically, you know, I would start with, with, with ball juggling. I think ball juggling is, is immense. I think it's very, very important. But it's not just a question of kids going out and just juggling a ball uh, and necessarily just seeing how many times they can, they can, they can keep it in the air or, you know, or juggle it. I think that's great. But I think they need to be far more creative. And without telling them what to do, I think we need to give them clues and give them the right guidance that will kind of – push them, if you like, in the right direction just to make their own decisions and create their own activities. So, for example, you know, when they're juggling, it might be that they uh, juggle the ball a certain number of times, maybe four times, and on, on the fifth juggle, they send it higher into the air and control it with a different part of their body every single time. So it's four juggles, sh four shorter juggles, lower followed by a higher one, four shorter followed by a higher one, and so on, and that sequence is repeated. It might be that they juggle the ball and every so often they call out a number between one and ten. So they call out that number seven, the ball's played into the air, they juggle it seven times and on the seventh touch they call out another number, a new number, and then they have to juggle it for that number of times. It might be that they establish a sequence uh, where they're actually using specific body parts. Maybe my sequence is right foot, left foot, right thigh, left thigh, right foot, left foot, right thigh, left thigh. And I continue that sequence. So we're really starting, or they're really starting to challenge themselves. It doesn't just become, I'm just juggling and I'm trying to get as many as I can. We're, we're, we're really working on the specifics of juggling and that type of thing. There's another good one, actually, that I picked up years ago from, uh, I think it was April Heinrichs with the, the US women's uh, national team. And she did something called, I think it was called 14-point juggling. I don't know if you've heard of 14 point juggling, but basically, with uh, with uh, I do it now with my team, and I call it 15 point juggling because I just I just added one more body part <laughs> to it. But basically, um, the the players juggle, and as they juggle, they try to to hit 14, or in my case, 15 different body parts. So it might be uh, right in step, left in step, uh, outside of the right, outside of the left, inside of the right, outside of the inside of the left. Sorry. Um, right thigh, left thigh, chest, head, right shoulder, left shoulder, right heel, uh, left heel, and then back of the neck. And they don't have to do it in any order. They just have to hit all, all 15 of those parts, not in any particular order, but it's a really good little challenge uh, for them to do. And if you've got players that can, uh, can hit all 15 body parts and, and do that within a juggling sequence, then they're doing pretty well. So 
that, that's ball juggling. Um, I think that dribbling is an incredibly important technical skill as well. Dribbling is something that, that the kids can easily do on their own as well. Uh, I think it's very, very important that they're creative about how they set up dribbling exercises, little dribbling drills. As we know right now, you know, the Internet is just full of, um, you know, hundreds of YouTube, hundreds and hundreds of YouTube um, footage of, of, of people demonstrating turns, fakes, dribbling. And I think that's great. I think those things are really, really important. You know, I like the Kurva type activities uh, and that type of thing. I think they're great. But, you know, if you've got a kid out there that doesn't know what to, to do and, and how to dribble necessarily or where to dribble, just go out. And if you've got no if you've got no markers, if you've got no cones, if you don't have access to that type of equipment, be creative and use something else. You and I were, were, were speaking about this earlier on today before we started. When I was a kid growing up, I think that I took every blade of grass off my parents backyard, um, literally just through practicing without any cones. Um, and I remember we had a swing in our backyard um, and, and that was used as something that I'd start by chipping the ball in between the, the handles of the swing as they hung down. Uh, I would make um, I would make markers using flower pots or um, empty water bottles or, you know, an empty Coca-Cola can or whatever it might be. Uh, the, the little garden sticks that my mum used to keep her flowers uh, up, <laughs> I'd pull those out of the ground and use those as uh, slalom poles to stick into the ground or even to rest on a couple of bricks and make hurdles, you know. Um, so you have to be creative. And that was the... Well, let me, the, sorry, well, let me ask you this, Mike. I think, and I wasn't trying to, to, to stem the flow there because there's some really good points that I think you're bringing up that, that really would be beneficial for some of the kids to hear over here. We didn't say we were going out to the backyard to practice. We were going out to play football. Right. That, that never, never ever did we... So the wording just probably for the parents, go out and practice some soccer. That word practice, maybe we never used that word. We just went out and played because we had a passion to want to play with a soccer ball. I'd also say there's no coaches at that particular time. I, I know for me, I was in an area and my parents were always working. I never had the access to go to even the local boys club that was there. Right. We couldn't get there. My grandma pretty much um, raised me. So I think there's also something to be said about you mentioned about not knowing how to dribble not knowing how to do things, you know, you, but in reality, I think some of the separate styles of players growing up when they are just having to play um, in the backyard or on the, the front street, they created their own style. It wasn't necessarily what a textbook would tell you or a coach would normally say, this is how you dribble. I think sometimes that context of us being out there is stifling to some of the kids by saying, well, no, we need to be doing this, this and this. When in reality, when we grew up, we kind of figured it out on our own and you yeah. created your own style. Um, yeah. So those are just yeah. two points I wanted to try and inject into there. Just as you were talking, I don't think I, we ever called it practice. I didn't. I don't know what you you called it to, but I always just say I'm just going out the back to play. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I think that I think the important thing here, and is that you know, for for all 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 us coaches listening, you know, the important thing here is that we're allowing kids to to create their own activities, to think for themselves, to be creative, but to make their own mistakes as well. And I think that's really important and, and, and more importantly to learn from those mistakes they make, because during this period of time, particularly, you know, we're not instructing them. We're not coaching them. We're not we're not teaching them from a technical perspective. Do this, do that. They're trying to figure it out for themselves. And, um, you know, we've we've created a or I say we've a culture has been has been created now where so on so many occasions we do things for the kids and when i say we i'm not necessarily just talking about coaches i'm talking about because i think we all overcoach at times i know i do at times um but we but we've parents they do things for their kids and, and i've been guilty of that you know being a being a father now being a dad i've been guilty of that at times no doubt but i think that sometimes we don't allow kids to to make uh, make their own mistakes and learn for themselves and i and i heard a great quote um it was a it was a year or so ago. I like to read a lot, uh, you know, uh, particularly books that are full of quotations and kind of inspirational stuff like that. That's probably my sports psychology background kicking in. But there was a quote from the father of um, an NFL quarterback for the Washington Redskins, and it, it said something like, um, "We must prepare the child for the path, and not prepare the path for the child." And I thought it was a great quote because that's to a large extent what we've done 
with you know a lot of the kids you know we do things for them we we um you know we facilitate things to the point where they're not necessarily thinking for themselves or able to have that uh, that mindset uh, as, as much as they could or should do uh and you know we've we've prepared the path for the for the, the child as opposed to preparing the child for the path if that makes sense and i, yes. I just thought it, was a, I thought it was a great quote it hit home to me a lot um and you know it's funny because if I don't know if you can see see all of the screen, but there's a there's a picture behind me there. A few years ago, I had the the good fortune to meet Thierry Henry in London, and there's a picture back there with with uh, he and I and, and my wife and 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 he said to me that he didn't do anything really structured in terms of you know technical development um, and 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 being coached until he was 14, 15 years of, of age at the earliest, um, and until that time, you know, he learned the game on the streets of Paris. Um, just as you learned it in your, you know, your backyard or front yard, and you know, I'm not comparing you to Thierry Henry, but by the way, but um, but, um, would have been a nice career. Yeah, but um, the the point is, is that he didn't have that structured coaching. He was able to to, to practice in an environment of free play, of street soccer, just as they do, you know, uh, in Brazil, all over the place, and you know, many other countries in the world. And I and I, I just do sometimes wonder if if uh, soccer in this country is, is so structured that it's actually uh, detrimental maybe without more of a balance to the development of, of, of our youth players here without that that free play in that concept yeah absolutely so we we're talking about the four the four corners there and i guess psychology is, is one of those biggest parts of that the child psychology the mind of the parent um can you expand a little bit upon on that side as well yeah um in, in terms of the the, the parents' psyche and or, or well, the kids, probably right? both, right? The kids and the parents. I think there's there's a well, probably the coach at the same time has got an influence into that psychology as well. Um, but yeah, but really in this day and age with the with a kid, again, we were definitely in different eras. Eras when we were growing up. You're a little bit older than me. You don't look it, by the way. I do definitely look older than you. But um, yeah. <laughs> but it, but we never had probably the computers they had right now probably never had the transportation and, and everything that comes about with that. I, I mean, for sure, you know, I remember still having the rabbit ears with the black and white TV. I mean, not that old, but it's still reality, right? Um, yeah. yeah. But, but I, I mean, think it, part it, of that makeup with the kids now is a restrictive in just getting outside, right? Yeah, it is. I mean, there, there, are, there are now, and again, something, something I read a little while ago, there are now evidently more mobile devices on the planet than there are people. So wow. it, it, it goes to show that, yeah, I mean, kids are, you know, kids are, are into this. I, you know, I get that. I understand that. But to prize them away from it is, is difficult. And I think that during this time, you know, it is particularly difficult for parents that are, that are still working. You know, they've had uh, you know, significant changes to their lifestyles. Maybe some people, unfortunately, have lost their job or part of their income and livelihood. So they're very preoccupied with that. And again, you know, kids are, are left uh, to their own devices. and given a choice a lot of kids their first option will be to you know to go to, to play switch or get on the computer play some games you know TikTok, whatever it may be um and it's it, it's very frustrating so i guess i mean going back to because i didn't want to i didn't want to kind of de depart from sure. what we're talking about on the technical side no but, absolutely I, my apologies yeah. on that you, you carry okay. on and make that bridge okay. no problem but, but go, going back to that side you know you, Talking about the ball juggling and the and the dribbling and that type of stuff. The other thing I wanted to talk about was, you know, what other techniques can realistically these kids be practicing um, right now on their own, again, with maybe just a soccer ball. And 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 I am a huge proponent of if if a kid has access to it, playing soccer against a wall or a curb, um, you know, in the street or something like that. Because if you can play soccer, and this is this not just now during the COVID-19 uh, situation, but, you know, before that and when this is all through, you know, after this, kids need to be in a situation where they're playing more on their own time and they're kicking a ball against the wall. And when I say kicking a ball against the wall, not necessarily just, um, you know, just inanely, just randomly doing stuff, but striking the ball, you know, uh, figuring out what technique works for them. It can be, it doesn't have to be just an inside of the foot pass. Um, with obviously using both feet, non-dominant foot as well. It can be uh, a passes with the outside of the foot. It can be a lofted pass. It can be a driven pass. It can be a chip against the wall. And again, 
I grew up playing soccer against the wall in my parents' backyard every single day, um, striking the ball again and again and again and again. So you're working on striking the ball. You're working on your, your technical ability. You're working on um, the, the accuracy and the, the power with which you're striking the ball. Um, you uh, obviously can work on different, um, different ranges of passing by changing the distance that you stand from the wall. If I move further back from the wall, you know, 20, 30 feet back, then maybe I can start working on lofted passes more or driven passes. If I get real tight to the wall and close to it, I can work on, you know, inside and outside of the foot, just one touch passing. But every time that ball comes back to me, I've automatically got a partner. I'm on my own, but the wall's my partner um, or the curb's my partner. You know, if I'm in the street outside, if it's not, if it's not a busy street and it's safe and, you know, you're able to do that. Um, but but do that again and again and again and get repetition of correct technique again and again and again uh, and work on that. And you're also working on the quality of your first touch, of course, which is so essential to any player. I've never seen, uh, you know, I've never seen a, a good soccer player with, you know, with a, with a good first, uh, a, with a bad first touch. Never seen a good, a, you know, so you have to work on the quality of the first touch and using that wall is really important. And where kids can really get creative with this is they can start actually maybe putting targets on the wall. Um, you know, they can put uh, a chalk. They can they can draw things in chalk on the wall if their parents allow them to do that. You know, whether it's a number or what, so they're striking and looking to strike a number now, hit a number. Maybe if they're, you know, if they're 18 to 25, 30 yards from the wall, maybe they can they can use that as a, an opportunity to practice some set plays, some free kicks mm -hmm. as well. Um, so I think that's a good option for them too. So use of a wall is is, is really a, a big deal if if you know if uh, the kids have got that. Fantastic. That's been a theme that's been throughout some of the webinars I've been on as well, and also a theme that I'm I'm passing on to my teams, uh, especially with some of my you know giving some yeah. of my stories. The the ball and the wall are your favorite. Your favorite yeah. friends so. and, and again again encourage them to you know as coaches we don't have to tell the kids what to do we can guide them we can point them in the right direction but then allow them to to make up their own games you know make up their own games you know maybe they're if, if they can't chip the ball high enough maybe they're throwing the ball you know against the wall and then they're working on their aerial control maybe when the ball comes back off the wall they're turning away they're controlling maybe doing a Cruyff turn out of the air whatever it might be you know, they're turning and dribbling away from the wall. Maybe they're um, showing away, they're checking away from the wall, checking in, playing a ball nice and hard into the wall, receiving it on their back foot and turning away with both feet. So you know, they're using that non-dominant foot too. But, you know, again, these are ideas that we know because, you know, we're experienced coaches and we've been doing this for a long time and, and we grew up doing that type of thing, you know, in the culture that we did. But these are things that the kids need to, I think, be, be, be practicing and trying. And it was funny because I was talking to one of my club players yesterday, you know, on the, pho on the phone. And I asked him what he'd been doing. And the first word was, well, nothing. And I said, well, what do you mean nothing? Surely you've been doing something. So, you know, we, uh, he did expand on that a little bit, which was, which was nice. And, um, you know, we got, onto, yeah, we, got, yeah, we got onto the topic of, of kicking a ball against the wall. And I gave him a few ideas, like we're talking about now. And, uh, you know, yesterday evening he said to me that he tried some of those things and they were really good and they worked. And I said, well, that's great because now I've, I've, you know, I've given you some clues what to do. Now you make up your own games. And next time we talk, why don't you share with me two or three of your own games that you've created that possibly are new to me that I haven't seen before. So there's your challenge. Go ahead, go do that. And if, and if you're listening into this and you're a parent, I think this is really key what, what, just, what you just heard there. I think imagination and kids, everything is laid out from computer games, coaching, whatever we're going to do in life, even schoolwork is all laid out from. There's not much thinking involved. When we were at the backyard, we had to make up our own games. I think we have to retry and reignite that imagination just to figure out, just, just figure something out, use something that's in the backyard, just anything. Like you said, you can kick it up against a curb or uh, is, is it what we call curbs out here? I think I still call it curb, the sidewalk yeah. edge or whatever. Yeah. They're not quite as, as um, tight corners in America they are back home, but um, use that on the wall. Um, just don't come back to me and say, "Hey, they told me to kick a wall, and you got a window in it." Don't be breaking no windows. But sure, sure. All right, that, do we want to move on? Yeah, I, was, I, I think I was going to say that kind of that that leads nicely actually into to more the tactical side of the game. And th yeah. this is where I think if you're an individual on your own and you've got the soccer ball and you know nobody to nobody to participate or play with, it's tough. 
you know, I mean, tactics, obviously, anything that involve making decisions. And I think the fundamental, the basic basics of tactics to me is, is, have always been 1v1. Well, if you're on your own, you haven't even got the luxury of playing in a 1v1 situation. So how can you make the game tactical if you're on your own? And, uh, you know, can it be done? Well, I mean, I think it can to some extent. Um, I was out in the, the front uh, in the, the front yard in the street outside our house uh, last week. And you know, my son was out there and he'd set up. Um, he's actually using the, the recycling bin. Believe it or not, so he was using the recycling bin to try and chip the ball into the bin from from distance. That's a, like the bin being the trash can, of course. Um, and then he put it out, and he was doing some of his curver moves, uh, trying to take on the, the the recycle bin. The recycle bin was replicating the defender. Well, that was that was that was really good. So um, I said to him, "Well, make that one v one situation. I know that I know that the recycling bin is not going to move, but make that into a two v one in your favour." And he said, well, what do you mean? I said, well, look, give me the ball. So he passed me the ball and I dribbled towards the, the recycling bin and I played a give and go with the curb. So obviously the ball comes off the curb. I run behind the, the recycling bin and collect the ball on the other side, having played a give and go with the curb. I said, okay, now it's a 2v1. So, and that was it, didn't really say too much else. But a little later on, I looked out the window and he's kind of doing it. And now he's working on trying to play a 2v1 <laughs> in this situation. And you know, is it, is it something that replicates what we do in practice uh, in terms of rondo type activities and possession play? Of course not. It doesn't come anywhere close to that, but it's about as close as you can get. And again, if we can point the kids in the right direction and encourage them to be creative and start thinking about, you know, what, what objects can we use to maybe do this, uh, you know, and help ourselves, then I think it's a good thing to do that. So, you know, from a tactical perspective, we were able to get a little bit of tactics out of it, make it a 2v1 situation um and he could create his own little games games from that you know even to the point where you know i'd say i did say to him later on well you know do it do it 10 times and of those 10 times i want you to execute that give and go successfully eight out of 10 times anything less than that it's not going to cut it so you know just things like that so they're, they're they're having little challenges and stuff but but the tactical side is is, is tough to do it's tough to do um i think from a physical perspective I guess just moving on to that. Um, well, gonna, before we go to the physical side, yeah. so even when you saw it saying there about the challenges, uh, to, to again, parents listening or kids listening, it's just not just about the challenges, it's maintaining that competitive edge. Um, you saying anything under eight is just not good enough. That creates that competitive edge that you still need to be chasing to, to be better and better and better at what you're doing. Yeah. And kids yeah. can, you know, again, we can reply back to when we were kids, I mean, playing spot against the wall, that was a competitive edge. You wanted to make sure you're hitting the wall all the time or you weren't going to be missing on any type of touches. So creating that competitive edge is always difficult when you're training on your own. But I think you brought up a good point there where you can create, um, you know, numbers you've got to hit and it's not good enough, it's not. So you have to keep going at it. I think that just yeah. keeps the competitiveness yeah. going as well. And, and, and also, I think it allows the kids to, you know, I mean, there's different ways of, there's different ways of playing a give and go, as you know. I mean, it could be that I'm playing the ball with the outside of my right foot. It could be that I'm playing it with the inside of my left foot on the initial pass and then receiving it on yeah. either the inside or, it, it or outside. It might even pop up. You might have to control your chest, not just your feet, yeah. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And, of course, you know, what we're talking about now, uh, you know, it, it relates tremendously to the, the age and the ability of the players that we're working with. You know, if you've got good level club players, they can do those types of things, or at least you'd hope that they can. Um, if uh, if it's more of a recreational player, um, you know, that doesn't perhaps have that skill set, then, you know, all these activities that we're talking about, you know, they're going to have to to make amendments for that. And they're going to have to, you know, if it's juggling, you know, maybe it's not flicking the ball up and just juggling it in the air a hundred times or using different parts of, of the body. Maybe it's throwing the ball into the air, allowing it to bounce once and then juggling it one time and then another bounce and then, juggling it one time so you know depending on what age and ability we're coaching we've got to make those variations uh impose those variations and, and conditions on on these exercises so that it's, it's realistic and the kids can achieve success absolutely and they'll know that in the backyard training themselves anyway yeah yeah okay physical physical yeah i think um for me the underlying the underlying denominator with with being on your own and working on on fitness is that it has to be soccer specific um it has to relate to the type of fitness that we would do that uh, that our kids would do in a, in a in a real game of soccer 
And I think so many coaches still, I have to say, and so many players, I still see coaches, you know, club coaches with kids just running, you know, running laps around the field without a ball. And, you know, if you do that, I'm, you know, I apologize, but it just, to me, it doesn't replicate, reflect the type of fitness in a real game of soccer. Um, and it doesn't matter what position you play, you know, in, uh, in, in the 11 aside game, um, obviously my team plays actually with a, with a four, three, three formation, the types of, 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 of fitness that, that players need, it's much more interval training based. It's, it's a series of sprints, jog, sprint, jog, sprint, jog. It's not a continuous run. So whilst, you know, my players telling me that they've run three or four miles, um, you know, at a, a steady eight minute, eight and a half minute mile pace or whatever it may be is good. It's not going to do any harm. It's going to help. It's not going to help them to the extent that I like it to. So, you know, what I've done, you know, with, you know, with my players is I've encouraged them to really follow a soccer specific routine, which involves interval training, but all the fitness training they do is with the ball. And I think that's very, very important. So it's a mix of, of, of interval training and, and ball work, but it's with the ball as they would be doing in a game. So, for example, I mean, we all know what um, sh shuttle runs or I think suicide, some people call it a, a call. I prefer, yeah. I prefer the term shuttle runs, but, um, you know, do the shuttle runs, but, but do it with the ball where the player dribbles to a cone and back to a second cone and back to a third cone and back all with the ball. And then when they get back, they don't necessarily rest, but they do what we call active recovery, where they then dribble out to the end cone at a slower pace. But that is their opportunity for active recovery. So they're still moving. They're still touching the ball. They're getting lots of exposure to the ball. And then when they get back to the start cone, they do the shuttles again to the first and back, to the second and back, to the third and back. Uh, and then they follow that by a period of active recovery. Now, you do that four or five times, um, it, it is physically very, very tough. And it's funny because, as I said, the, the boys on my team that have been doing this, that, you know, they've commented how, how challenging it is to do that. Um, you know, uh, one and another one that I like is, is where a player just basically dribbles out from one cone to another about 30 yards away. It doesn't have to be a cone. It could be a, a, a shoe or a, a, an apple or, you know, a sock or whatever it might be. You can put or a couple of T-shirts 30 yards apart. So you dribble out, to, dribble out uh, with a ball. When you get to the, the end, you juggle 10, 15, 20 times, whatever it may be. You then sprint back to the start cone. You jog out to the, the far cone, juggle again 20, 30 times, leave the ball, sprint back, and so on. So it's a mix of interval training and ball work. Uh, and of course, the, the, the level of difficulty can be, it can be amended um, either by um, increasing um, the number of repetitions that the players do or by decreasing the recovery time that they have or a combination of the two. Um, or maybe a distance you know, as well. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. So I think that the important thing with fitness is that it's done with a ball. Um, it's done with a high intensity, um, lots of repetitions, uh, and I would say minimal recovery, um, particularly when the players are, are club players and they're, and they're getting older, you know? Now, I would argue that probably at home in this particular, predicament that we're in right now that's probably the toughest for most kids that are going to want to go out and play with the ball at the back they're going to, want to do all the the technical and tactical stuff and the physical yeah. side is is really not going to be the exciting stuff to do and it's um, it's 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 not and I've, I've had to break it down so in our in our house we have a we have a, a monday wednesday friday soccer routine and again i'm involved in this to some extent but you know i want my kid to, to basically be doing this for himself so mondays is our technical fitness day, kind of doing the things that I've just been describing. Wednesdays is more of a technical tactical day where we actually do a lot of, um, we do a lot more finishing. As I said, we have the luxury of having the equipment to be able to do that. But if I'm not around or if the equipment's not available, then then obviously, uh, you know, we're looking to, to practice finishing and striking the ball against that wall. And then Fridays is, um, Fridays is, a, is more of a fun soccer day and on, on Fridays we've been doing we've been playing a lot of soccer tennis and soccer volleyball and again you know you can replicate setting up a little net with you know various objects we're fortunate enough to have a, a little soccer net that we can put up but if not you know just make a make a net um, or not necessarily you know a physical net but just make a, some sort of barrier uh, that you can that can use or replicate a, a net and you can play some soccer volleyball or soccer tennis so 
Friday's a fun, more of a fun day. For us, Heck, sometimes yeah. even just chalk on the ground would work, just as a okay. as a, somewhere to get the ball into. Yeah, I know we've we've done that quite a few times growing yeah. up. So one of those stones that makes the the mark. So yeah. Was there anything else on the physical side you wanted to touch upon? Um, no, not so much on the physical. Again, I just I would just emphasise that you know doing doing the the exercises that with the ball is is just essential. Um, and I think that. Um, yeah, I mean, I think I think that's pretty much pretty much do, doing it with the ball, but but replicating the real game, replicating the real game. The fitness that the players should be doing should be should be something that that replicates the real game. And to be quite honest, as as the temperatures starting to already change now, and we know what it's like in in Texas, as it's going to get warmer now, you know, with the kids doing this type of thing, making sure that they they are getting some rest breaks and and that they're staying hydrated, of course, is is essential. But I think it's something that the fitness is probably one of the most controllable aspects during the whole COVID-19 experience that they, you know, the kids can actually control, you know. But I also think that um, I would say that on the fitness component, and I think the cross training is very important too. Um, you know, I encourage my players to not just do soccer. Like I, think and, cro yeah. I think cross training is essential. Um, if they're fortunate enough to, I know some, some people are fortunate enough to have a swimming pool, so they can the kids can swim a little bit. I'm a huge proponent of swimming. I think it's fantastic for pretty much uh, utilizing every every joint and, and muscle group in the body. It's a great cardiovascular workout. So I think swimming is great. I think biking is great. I know that uh, you know quite a few of the kids that I coach enjoy biking as well. And we've also been doing some of the high intensity interval training Tabata stuff as well recently so that's kind of it's 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 hiit training with with little to no recovery the tabata and there's a yeah. lot of good things in there that relate to balance and and, and development of upper body strength and, and that type of thing as well so cross training and, and recoveries mm -hmm. yeah cr yeah absolutely cross training is essential and stretching too stretching too because yeah, i read an article from holland uh from the netherlands uh that, that said that um that uh a lot of uh, soccer players that, that, that turn to, to cycling, it's great, but it does actually shorten their hamstrings and leaves them more prone to hamstring in, in injuries. So that's something that they, they advocate the stretching a lot too if you're doing a lot of biking and you're not used to it. So, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I think that's, again, I think it's one of the hardest points is to is to get a kid out. Um, this motivation, right? is to try yeah. and get that kid off and do the, the fitness side of it because I think that's probably the least most exciting for people to do and they know that although hard work and, and that type of work is going to improve them it's also probably the hardest work they got to do um, oh absolutely there's going to be continuous um physical activity so well to, to complete the four corners did you want to move on to what I'd rushed you on to earlier yeah the, uh, yeah because <laughs> the, the psychological side of the game yeah I think is, is really important again I think this is this has got to be. This is a tough time for for um, for kids. I think anywhere, whether they play soccer or not, um, you know, I worry about how some kids. Um, obviously, the kids that, that play for my team or teams, uh, you know, my high school team as well as uh, as my club team, I worry how they're coping through through this. The lack of social interaction is is incredibly evident. Uh, and I think that after, you know, a couple of months of going through this now and, and, and maybe, you know, some more time still before we get back to kind of life as we knew it, uh, this is tough. So I, I do, you know, I'm generally concerned and worried for the, the, the well-being and welfare of a lot of the kids and, and how they're, they're dealing with all this. I think with playing no games, no tournaments, um, I think it makes it even tougher. I think some of the kids, they've alluded to me, well, you know, why, why do we need to practice or why do we need to practice so much? Uh, given the schoolwork that we have to do and, and other things, household chores, whatever it may be, uh, if we're not going to be playing in any games, uh, it's tough. And as a coach, I think, you know, we have to be seen to be giving the kids opportunities to do things. Um, but at the same, same time, I think we need to be very sensitive to what they're feeling, you know, when they do this. So I think it's very important for them to be self-motivated. And that is so tough during this, this, this present time. So what I've done with, with my team, I, I, I've set them goals and targets if you like things to do but i've told them that their goals and objectives have to be their own goals they're not necessarily my goals for them they have to be their own goals during this time whether it's technical tactical physical whatever it might be um, and i've given them a little acronym 
to, to help them out with that. So, you know, if any of the, the, the folks listen to this webinar, you know, want, want to use this, I hope it would help. But the, the acronym that I use is the word SCAMP, S-C-A-M-P. And what SCAMP basically stands for when it comes to, to setting objectives and, and goals is the S, the S stands for specific, the C for challenging, the A for attainable, the M for measurable, and the P for personal. So you've got specific, challenging, attainable, measurable, and personal. And that forms the acronym SCAM. Um, I want the goals to be specific, specific to them. What they might feel they want or need to work on might not be the same as one of their teammates or one of their friends. Their goals have to be challenging. It's no good, um, you know, now my son going out and saying, I'm going to juggle the ball 10 times. It's not challenging for him and for, you know, most club players, I would hope. You know, it has to be something that's significantly more challenging and, 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 uh, and that he's going to benefit from, as with any player. Um, goals have to be attainable. Um, in other words, they have to be realistic as well. So set goals, but, but make them goals that, um, that you feel as an individual can be achieved. And once they have been achieved, then um, set a new goal and, and look to continuously improve and develop and, and strive to always be better. You know, that, uh, that never stops. Excellence, the, the, the pursuit of excellence never stops. There's no, there's no finish line. When it comes to the pursuit of excellence, there is no finish line. So I want to get that across to them as well. The goals need to be measurable. Um, so I would encourage kids, even though it's difficult, I know, I would encourage kids to keep some sort of log of the things that they've done, um, the targets that they've achieved, you know, whether it's daily, weekly, whatever it might be, and make those specific so they can measure their progress. And if they feel that they want to share that progress with me, which I encourage them to do, of course, as their coach, then they do that. And then finally, as, as I said, those goals have got to be personal um, and they've got to be uh, personal and relate to, to, to each, each player as an individual. Now, I know that you're teaching boys or you're coaching boys. Um, of course, you teach in school, so you're teaching both in there. Yeah. Um, with I've, I've just been doing this with the girls. Again, trying to get – I asked them about setting goals just yesterday. Actually, I've been doing it all week about setting goals. Um, details. I think details is an important part as well because, you know, I was asking them – I just gave, asked them to do a, a goal setting. For, for example, one kid just said, well, I'll improve my skills. Yeah. It's not detailed. What are you trying to improve in skills and how are you going to measure it from now till four weeks time, which we're asking you to do it. So yeah. putting those things into practice would be maybe with your left inside foot, you're passing against a wall between some gates, 10 yards out. You're trying to get eight out of 10, just like you said there, trying to get that number up. And then you can measure it over a period yeah. of time to be 10 times, 11 times, 12 times. Or maybe you take the distance a little bit further back or this time it's going to be on the outside of the foot or it's going to be when you receive it, you have to pop it up and bring it down. So I think detail is also a pretty important thing there um, when you're trying to get that measurability of what you're, of your goal setting. Yeah, ab ab absolutely. And it relates, to, it relates to all the things that we've talked about today. The goal setting, it, it can relate to a technical component of the game. It can relate to a tactical one, to a physical one. I mean, it could be, as I said, going back to the physical one, I don't think I ever actually finished my sentence about the 4-3-3 that we played, but, but, you know, players within any formation, within any formation, if they're working on that type of fitness exercises with the ball, they're going to have to make those type of interval runs. So it might be that you're setting goals with regards to how many runs you make. Um, you know, you could be within a 4-3-3, you could be an outside defender making an overlapping runs for 90 minutes throughout the game. These days, as you know, better than anybody, as well as anybody, you know, uh, defenders, when when their team is in possession of the ball, they're not defending because there's nothing to defend, so they've got to join the attack. Um, yeah. You know, a midfield player making a, a run from a deeper position to, to to move from the middle third of the field into the attacking third of the field. They've got to make those types of runs. So, yeah, setting goals to do that um, is really important. So so going back to, to the um, psychology of things, girls are very different to the boys as well um, in, in times of where we're at right now, training at home, um, not really able to get together and do a practice because girls are very much social, yeah. very social. So, yeah. so part and parcel of that also is, you know, I think there's a lot of teams out there that are still connecting on through video and, and even just watching us on this, this is still a connection for them through, um, but they can always set challenges for each other as well. Um, 
you know, when they've got those goals yeah. in their setting, maybe make them into challenges as well, that they can then connect with the other girls. And, and really, I'm talking about the girls' side, because the boys don't, yes, they need that interaction, but it's not as much needed as what the girls are. Um, yeah. And, yeah. and um, something from my side, I think in this day, yes, the four corner approach has, has, has been there and it's been part of our DNA within our club. And it's pretty much, a, a, you know, a, a research fact for, for most people going through the, the four corners. But we've introduced a fifth now, so it's no longer a corner, but we've got the fifth pillar um, because I do believe in the psychology, the mental health and the social side it can can be so much more than just a sports psychology of things. So um, for us in the club, we, we also, you know, we've got mental health um, first aiders in every one of our teams. So that's a very big point there with, with the girls and the boys and making sure they're again in these in these times when you're not seeing as many people you're just seeing your parents you know it's, it's it yeah. can wear on you when when we're not used to it you know we're you could probably say 100 years ago that people would probably be just as as normal as as being in these situations and being locked down uh, especially with how things were um 80 90 years ago but nowadays we're not used to it we're used to being free and doing what we want meeting who we want going to birthday parties and all of a sudden that came to a stop halting stop real quick so um, that mental side is very important. And going back to your physical, um, work, we can even turn around and say, trying to get somebody off the sofa and getting them out to play and give them that motivation, just that stimulates um, exercise, stimulates happy hormones and endorphins and stuff like that as well. Um, not having that exercise and not not pushing yourself outside can tend to lead to a little bit of, ooh, you know, and um so that's important as well so all told everything that we've been talking around here is just for the complete not just improve in in your sport you're playing soccer of course what we're talking about but just as as being as a as a, a well a well-rounded and a well healthy um person and kids so yeah. and by all means parents get out with them as well well yeah and i think there... um i'm oh, sorry Anna, i was, was going to say i think, I think uh, the lesson i think the lessons that we're learning from this experience is, as i said kind of towards the start of the webinar you know, as, as difficult and as challenging as this situation is for everybody concerned, I think that we must look look at it as being an opportunity. Um, you know, life's going to throw lemons at us throughout our lives. It's, it's going to do that. So, you know, obviously that the old saying, you know, when life throws you lemons, make lemonade. I mean, this is something that, that, that we need to try to do to try to stay positive. You know, this situation will pass, no doubt, and hopefully sooner rather than later, and we will get back to to you know our lives as we as we kind of knew them before in some sense of normality but um the lessons that you know our young our young players and, and people can learn now from doing this hopefully it won't just help it won't just help them to get through this difficult period now but it will stand them in good stead for the, the future and i think it will you know it will make them stronger uh and we'll learn from it well, I completely agree. I think this for this period of time, as soon as we went down to lockdown, or I knew that Europe was going to lockdown, so I knew we weren't far behind. I think one of my personal goals for myself, and I've spoken to you about this, and I've spoken to Rich and a couple of other people, is the art of individual training. The, and I hate to say that word training, just the art of getting outside and, and not having somebody telling you to go outside and play with a ball, but actually wanting to pick a ball up and go out without having to say, I don't know what to do. If we can re reinvent that individual imagination and, and just picking up a ball and making gains out of it that ultimately is going to improve their skill work and their control and their passing anyway inadvertently just picking a ball up and playing with it um would be a success i don't know if we're going to get that success yet i'm still fine with it with my kids but i mean what are we into this now week seven into this um you know and it, it's getting i think like we talked about on the on the mental side i think more and more it's Groundhog Day for a lot of these kids. Get up, school work, do a soccer, go down. We, we trying to change it a little bit and trying to get them to go out and just experiment and, and, and have imagination and just you know find their own style if you like, be be their own people. I remember. Do you remember Mike um, when World Cups used to pop up? Nike and Adidas used to have a competition with commercials and used to have the one v one in the cages and they used to have the those special commercials that they would think the kid would be dreaming and he's playing against Ronaldo and Beckham and right. uh, for some of these younger players they might I may you know it, we're talking about the older Ronaldo not the new Ronaldo but, but right. regards to those again I thought those would stimulate the types of players that would want to go out and just try those things um you know and I, I still don't see enough of it I think in our society and, and I was if we're going to see anything positive come out of what we're going through right now, that was what I was hoping would be positive. That would create a little bit more creative players, a little bit more individualistic 
um, players that had uh, a style about them that we weren't knocking out of. We weren't creating the same player and the same player and the same player uh, as coaches. And I, we don't mean to do that, but we're, we're coaching to teams. You know, I think a chance to coach for people to express themselves individually is at home. We don't have that ability to do five days a week and then coach individual players to try and make them, again, it could be too much coaching. I think that sometimes in our society, we're over coaching possibly, or not just coaches, but everything. We're over telling kids what to do. No, do this, no, do that. No, you, you've done that right. Why do you do it like that? And there's no correction process. It's just, you did it wrong, do it like this. Um, and that's across, not just soccer. I'm just talking across the board. Um, so hopefully I would like to see uh, you know, my kid's way too too young to be able to know that, but maybe I can rethink myself. Hey, when he's getting older, he hopefully he'll love the sport. But whatever he goes into, he can go out and and just do it himself as well, and and try and create his own style, create who he's going to be, um, as opposed to to what we think they should be. Absolutely, and I think uh, yeah, I agree agree with everything that you've said there. I think it's, it's that's really good information, and I think that. The, the the American psyche, as we've talked about, and the role of the coach within the American society. I think soccer, in some ways, is perhaps um, not always benefited from that because you know the more traditional American sports, you know, your football and your baseball and your basketball. I think that people in this country have drawn on the principles of those more traditional sports when it comes to coaching, and there is so much coaching in those sports. I mean, let's mm -hmm. be honest: is you know, a sport like football is so coach oriented. Um, talking about American football. Um, well, I do remember on that American football, even a coach telling you when you know it's wrong, and that's what they want you to do, period. If you still do it, you know, if you go against the grain, you're in trouble yeah. for doing it. So I think you're right. Yeah. That mentality is sometimes. Well, and I think this is going to be an interesting time. We'll, we'll look back, back on this in years to come or maybe, you know, maybe even in the near future and wonder if the the extent to which we have the organization and structure um, in place in youth sports in this in this country, particularly where soccer is concerned, you know, is it a good thing? Um, is it something that could be more balanced? Because, you know, uh, I'm going back a while now, and I think that having been here for 26 years now in the States, the, the development of soccer has been quite incredible. I mean, you know, people talk about MLS and uh, the MS, mm -hmm. MLS League, where it is in relation to the rest of the world. But, I mean, let's not forget that I think MLS has been around for maybe 25 years now. Since 94. Like, mm -hmm. Yes, my at. So, um Bit longer than that but it's still it's still in terms of, of, of sports professional sports leagues it's a very very young league still so the, yeah. the strides that the soccer has made as a professional spectator sport have been significant i still don't think that um the average american um sports fan is necessarily attuned to soccer as a professional spectator sport as they are as a youth participatory sport i think it's different those two things and I still think there's a tremendous uh, you know, way to go when it comes to soccer being a professional spectator sport. We get uh, drawn into to the, the enjoyment of it, being involved. This is our job. This is our you know, livelihood. This is our passion. Um, but um, if you go back to, to 2002, I guess it was a 2002 World Cup. And, you know, one considers that the men's national team, the U.S. men's team did make the quarterfinals in that World Cup, which is, was, mm -hmm. was a tremendous achievement. And then we fast forward from 2002 to 2018, where unfortunately the US team doesn't qualify for the World Cup, despite the incredible amount of organization and structure, the resources, the financial support um, that the top organizations have um, in a country of, I think it's 330 million people now in the States. And that does kind of beg the question, you know, are we doing the right things in terms of that level or degree of organization and structure or might free play um, and um, allowing players to play in a more informal free play environment where they're not playing 11 v 11 um, until they're a little bit older. Maybe that would be more beneficial. It's, it's food for thought. Well, you know what that that. I was going to, yeah, that's definitely true, but there could be an argument said for Italy and for England. I think there's been some some big teams that have got an infrastructure in place and free play that probably hasn't qualified, but not the numbers that US have. However, um, got Paddy's question now. So it was written, he wrote this all the way back when we first interrupted, um, but I think now it could tie us up a little bit and what okay. we're talking about. Um, hi, Mike. Great to see you and hear from you. Uh, with the number of players playing the game in the USA, why do you think we seem to struggle to get further in the World Cup? See how much that just tied in. You that kind of answered that. it a little bit with your thoughts, well, but why don't we expand about it just a little bit there? 
I think I think that does tie in with it. It's, it's a great question. Hey, Paddy, how you doing, mate? Hope you're doing well. I haven't seen you for a while. So um, I did see you on your webinar the other week. That was very good. Um, so yeah, I mean that ties in nicely. But yeah, I mean I think I think that's a large part of it. The the, the culture again that uh, and the psyche that that is represented in this country. It's not the same as in other countries when it comes to the youth sports culture. It just isn't. And even though um, specialization is is now at, at a much earlier age is 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 occurring in, in not just the the states but in other countries like England as well. Um, there's been so much more free play and opportunity for, to, for for kids to express themselves on their own or with their friends, just in small groups, just playing on the street or you know on the beaches of Brazil or wherever it may be, um, in the streets of Paris. Um, I don't know where Paddy was playing in the in the, the bogs in in, in Ireland. Is that right? North side Dublin. <laughs> North side Dublin. All right. So I'm just joking. I'm just joking. <laughs> he, he knows that. So. But but that culture has not really been replicated too much, and it's funny because probably, well, in my opinion, arguably the most exciting U.S. player. We're obviously we're talking about the men's game, and you know we're not really touching on the women's game right now. And the, the women have done an incredible job. What an incredible job the women's team have done! Not mm -hmm. only you know being the best team in the world and you know um, developing the players that they have, but retaining that that stature and that 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 position despite for quite a long time yeah. yeah for a long time despite other countries arguably you know catching up with them to some extent whether it's china or japan or norway or sweden or germany in the women's game but um yeah in the men's game you take a player like like christian pulisic uh you look at the excitement that uh that people get when they watch him play and you look at his background you consider his background and yes um yeah i mean he was born and raised in america but a large part of his youth he did spend in europe mm -hmm. uh overseas um germany and you know learning the game and developing there in a very different soccer culture and environment with a very different with a very different psych psyche and it's a lot of pressure to put on a young lad like pulisic not only to to lead and captain the us uh, you know at the young age of the years but kind of carry them on his shoulders to some extent and i've got to think that um you know i've got to think that that the U.S. needs to be developing other players, you know, you know, that are more akin to Pulisic. Of course, people could say the same about some English players I know, the English mm -hmm. team. But I, I do think there's a little bit more. Um, I do think there's a little bit more um, creativity, you know, with English players in 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 some ways. Players like, you know, Deli Ali that are playing now in in midfield, and um, Jack Grealish coming through. You know, young lads like that that are playing. Um, you're always going to need the Jordan Hendersons of this world because they are so essential to a team. Uh, and, and arguably the last really creative, really creative English player that I can think of was probably probably Gazza. Probably Paul Gazza. Gazza, yeah. Well, I, I think um, to jump onto Paddy's question there, um, you know, I had Ian Foyer on yesterday and he made a really good comment. He moved from the Premier League, Premiership, before it became Premier League, but it's still the Premier League. Um, West Ham had Rio Ferdinand in front of him. Good decision making the culture that's in europe i'm not just going to say england but in europe the culture is that they live and breathe soccer pre predominantly in, in some of the major big soccer countries that your spanish your italians your portuguese your germans the english the scottish i mean there's some big big nations there that that's what they do um and it's such a culture that in the breaks of school they break out an impromptu game you know 18 against 18 it's just an impromptu game it's done people switch sides all the time when they leave school they go home they're probably kicking the ball on the way home they're playing school soccer that just the the decision making with the amount and and the culture they have there is different to here in america even though we have in this particular country so many in terms of population compared to the scots the english the welsh even the spanish and the french and the the germans that the population there is nothing close to what we got here but that culture hasn't yet like you mentioned mike set in um but on the same point of that i did write a paper paddy you can look on our website and have a read on it and it, it really did the same thing it talked about why america didn't or the usa hadn't made the world cup and the relationship between some other countries haven't made the world cup but i think it comes back down to culture individual training just wanting to go out and, and practice on their own and too much of a coach-led environment and and you know what we obviously i can be accused of being part and parcel of that problem because i'm in that industry and i'm in the coaching industry as well but i think even with coaches as what we are 
um, we we have a responsibility to try and instill a passion and a passion enough for those players to go back and want to play more back home and and try and maybe do some pickup games or just impromptu and even in practice maybe those impromptu games where it's it's very unstructured in terms of how we set it up. I mean, I remember one thing I remember, Mike and Patty, when I first came here, there was a kid that came up to me. Um, we just did tryouts. Um, I'm fresh off the boat, right? And our field never had goals. So he turned around, he goes, um, my dad said, I'm leaving the team. I was like, why is that? Because there's no goals. What, what are you talking about? There's no goals. You're not going to you're not gonna play soccer because there's no goals because we just put down a couple of bibs and that's the goal scoring. Yeah, I, I don't, I can't aim for those. Where, where's the height? Where's the, but I remember growing up and you'd say, no, that was in. And you'd argue about it a couple of times. No, that was in, that was out. But you knew if you could beat the goalkeeper, you're still shooting. You still got everything to do with soccer. You just haven't got this post. And I felt that really was what, from the very first time I, I decided to live here, was what I was going to be up against was that, well, we must have the pristine balls, the pristine cones, the pristine poles. And I still see it now. I see all of these, um, even with my teams, I see all of these new technologies coming out. The dribble up ball seems to be like the fanatic one right now. But before that, there was all kinds of different technologies that, these companies are jumping on to sell to the American market because those kids are trying to get that, I guess, that magic pill to be able to learn straight off. But also that they don't have that sense like we did or and I'll tell you right now, I've got boys in my team in, in some of our teams that will the the culture that they were brought up into, maybe the Central American, the Southern American kids in 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 ethnic, you know, historical sense of the word, a culture, they do go out and play because it's in the culture and they follow the leagues um that's another part you know are we following the lead so patty there's a good read there if you want to i'm not that i'm promoting my uh my article by any means but it is it, you know it's something that that hit home to me and it took a while to write it and maybe that would answer some of those as well i don't know if you want anything to add to that mike i've got another question as well, well. i was just, just going to say i mean to, maybe to answer patty's question a little bit more directly i think you mean the, the the pay to play system in this country you know for the most part with club select sports is um is is a significant probably factor into into why some players some very talented players are are missed they you know they fall through the cracks or they're not even having the opportunity to play i know that and probably patty too and you know a lot of coaches i know uh, you, you guys do a great job i think of of um of, of helping players that perhaps couldn't afford to play and, um, you know, I've tried to do the same thing, you know, when I can over the years. But um, I think that's a massive factor, too. The pay to play system in this country doesn't doesn't necessarily work. Um, and I think that maybe a lot of talented players are missed, you know, for that reason. So I think that's something that um, that needs to be a or that is a contributory factor. As well. And you know what, I think I think that could be a conversation in itself because again, the paper I wrote actually the title was American Youth Soccer: the the, the conundrum of the paper play system. And I actually argue that the paper play system isn't a bad thing, but it's how it's paid for. So I think, and I'm not going to go into a new whole new conversation because we could have another conversation about that. But the main deal about the paper I wrote was, you know, there's no way of the money we, we develop the kids to be able to come back into the clubs in this particular country. So therefore. We have to be able to purse it. We have to be able to pay for it some way because we're not connected with such a, a league like they are in the UK or in or England, sorry, or is in Spain, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so, and I think there's an argument when I was growing up in, in England and I had opportunities to play for play coach for professional clubs there. The positions are very small and, and few far between full time jobs. It would be better if there's some kind of pay for play system there because you'd get more coaches that didn't have full-time jobs that would put more time into coaching and I think they put more time into the players and the teams they have so I think there's a conundrum either way either way you could read that from what my point of view is if you wish to but I do have you know uh, you know I do have a, a point of view on the paper play system but I don't necessarily think it's a bad thing what I do think would be bad would be made maybe the professional clubs here in the states being in the youth market and it becomes a must win situation to maintain your paper place so the coach's job is to make sure to keep their team therefore development goes out the window if there's a way of doing something like other european clubs where you could develop players um and if they get selected to go and play we'll talk about da in a minute but da and ec now or whatever the case may be and we weren't allowed in those but it's just mls clubs i think at that point if i had a player that went to play for FC dallas automatically clubs will change from winning to developing because if you develop you can get kids to come to your club because you've got the better coaches the better 
infrastructure in place to be able to have player upon player picked by, let's say, FC Dallas or Houston Dynamo, wherever the case may be. But again, you can make your own mind up about that. That's that's kind of my my take on it. So that does lead me into Paddy's other question here. What are your thoughts on the Federation scrapping the DA? I'm not sure we're following the same kind of webinar topic here, but <laughs> it is a question nonetheless. Yeah, honestly, honestly don't know on that one. I mean, I think the DA, the boys side had been around for it maybe 12, 12 years, I believe the DA side. Long? So yeah, I think so on the, on the boys Damn, side. Get away from me. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I don't know. I, I would imagine that there would be, or that there are a lot of parents and players that have been involved with the DA that may be a little bit, um, perhaps a little bit disillusioned right now as to, to why they invested so much time. <laughs> You being one of them, I would imagine with Luke, right? Um, he's not actually doing. He's not actually doing DA. No, we didn't. We didn't go no, that route. But, he's, he, but there's opportunities. Had DA been there, still there's opportunities for him as he's growing, right? Yes, ab absolutely. And I and I do in think, the age he is. Yeah, I, I do think that um, it's very important that, that that all players, you know, whether it's DA or, or probably now ECNL, um, that that players that that are legitimately good enough that they have the opportunity to play with and against other quality players i think that's how how one improves how one gets better mm -hmm. um i mean logistically logistically for for us where we live in fort worth the biggest challenge that we have when it comes to to that is just that, uh, that most of the offerings uh, when it comes to the, the that highest level of play if you like uh, are in the dallas area so there are very that's very just practice that's just that's, yeah absolutely that's just practice yeah so um you know it kind of goes back to 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 my my feeling that uh, of specialization i think that players that are that are playing da uh, or were playing da that are doing ecnl whatever it might be I, I think it's great on one level but on another level it really is another example of, of, of specialization in one activity or one sport at a, at a comparatively very young age you know whether they're 12 13 11 12 13 that they're still very young doing that you know um I can see it more when the players are a little bit older, maybe when they're 15, 15 and up, getting involved at that level of play and that degree of specialization. But, um, you know, I was never a big fan of the DA's ruling on, on, on kids not being able to play high school sports as well. I thought that was a great shame um, that, um, you know, kids weren't able, able to do that. I experienced it firsthand with my high school goalkeeper, who was also uh, a DA goalkeeper. He's graduating this year. He's a senior, so he's graduating. Well, he would have been graduating, I think, um, tomorrow, had graduation been taking place. Um, and he, in his in his junior and senior senior year at school, was never able to play um, for for the school team because of his commitment to DA. And I, I just thought that was a, a great shame. I mean, you know, his team were very successful. They won they won the national DA championship. Um, and I, I think that's a, that's an experience that you know he'll remember for the rest of his life but i also know that he you know he he sorely missed playing at school with his friends at school and being able to represent the school team so i think things like that you know there's got to be a bit more scope on whatever the next highest echelon or level of, of soccer is whether it's ecnl or whether it's something else um i think there has to be some some sense of sensitivity to, to to players being able to play and represent their schools as well um, but I do think with um, the improvement of what we want to do at the highest, I mean, we, we don't want to keep looking at the men's national team, but ultimately that's what, you know, at grassroots level, that's what we're trying to do is, is instill that passion. And hopefully we get some kids that can go on and, and make an impact on the big stage. But um, I think one of the biggest issues here, the DA was a great idea. I think limited substitutions is not a great idea. I don't think that huge rosters are a good idea at DA. And I don't think that the travel was, was, was great. And then at the same time, was there enough games I think the practice to game ratio was obviously thought about very intently, but I think a lot of kids dropped out of DA because they wanted to play more. Kids want to play, right? So yeah. I think every every intention to make the DA work and to make, I think, money obviously in the end, as, as US soccer came out, was obviously the, the be all and end all of the demise of that particular. But I still think there'll be, the MLS will, will come in and fulfill that, that um, void, but I don't see how the travel aspect of the game. I remember a couple of kids, that we know in this area, I mean, they'll travel to Colorado for a game on a school week or a school term, Saturday off to Colorado, then they're off to 
St. Louis and then back down to, to Dallas. And I don't know how healthy that is with that much travel time and getting out of a car, play, get in a car, drive. And at the same time, how much that would really instill a passion for the game if you'd done those drives and never got to touch a field period because of the limitations on substitutions. Um, so I think there's a there's a lot to be said about, and I, and I think that's a, another topic again for another reason. We're, we're kind of off topic here right now, but um, I, th I think there's a lot to be said about leagues that can that can create meaningful competition, enough competition that's not too much. You know, parents want it all the time, kids want it all the time, but you don't want to overuse that energy and overuse kids so that they're, you know, they're burnt out at early ages, but at the same time, enough to keep their interest that they want to stay in that elite league so they've got enough games to be in played and not just practice, practice, practice with no reward of a game at the end of it. So I think there's a very, I think there's a sweet spot there somewhere, um, but, you know, it's above my pay grade. I have to worry about our club and not not league so much so well mike i i did tell you when we take our guests i really don't like to take much more an hour we have gone way past an hour yeah. um, we do like to talk i guess uh, but i will tell you i think this has been um out of all the webinars we've done we've got some great webinars and i think you've listened to some of them as well this has been one of the most on topic on well towards the end it wasn't maybe with some of the questions coming in but however for for the 98 99 percent of it on topic very relevant right now and I also think very relevant that when we come out of this lockdown, um, forced lockdown, whatever you want to call it, if we can reintroduce some, some new methods to some people, and they're not new, they're just old methods, but reintroduce them. And hopefully this would um, would help would help our kids go further. I think also that wasn't touched upon is it's probably with the amount of times I know within our with our teams, we've got some teams that play two leagues, um, you know, the MPL, the Classic League. I think this forced shutdown has probably given some of these kids a really good well-earned rest on their bodies from game time so with with games in the united states i find 48 weeks of the year primarily now um this has probably been good for for just a bit of yes i do miss it yes i'm not being forced by my mom and dad and yes i want to get back to it and maybe that individual training can can hopefully kickstart that as well so i want to say thank you so much mike it's been an absolute tremendous time i hope you've thank enjoyed you. it Absolutely, yeah, it's been a pleasure. It's always great to talk to you and uh, you know Paddy there too. I hope that anyone listening, everyone listening to this, got something out of it. It's just you know food for thought as much as anything else. Just exchange some ideas and you know good luck to everybody. Um, hang in there during this time. You know, um, keep working with your kids and you know nurturing them and and, and caring about them and their development. And um, you know we'll get through this and we'll be back to we'll be back to life as we knew it. Hopefully, hopefully very soon. Sooner than you think. So you think, well, I will say this before we, we wrap this one up, um, we're saying goodbye and shutting it down. We do actually have Richard Smith, which is also another one of our good friends. Um, worked, we all worked together um, 20 years ago. He, him and I are going to be discussing um, RTPs, our return to play protocols. Um, now that the state of Texas is looking to open up somewhat, we're going to see what those RTPs look like, what we need to think about, what coaches should be thinking about. Um, um, and, and how that would look and what type of sessions you'll be looking to do when you come back. So tune in, that'll be next Thursday. So I do recommend tuning in because what with this um, topic we just spoke about, that would be a very uh, important topic. Uh, I think there's a lot of clubs and teams eager to get back without the thought process of what would the RTP look like. And um, can, I, can I just say on that, Anne, can you ask, uh, when you see Richie, can you ask him to wear a mask? <laughs> <laughs> yes, absolutely. I can do that as well. <laughs> okay all right man it's been an absolute pleasure um, and thank you all for for tuning in we look forward to seeing you on our next webinar um which will be uh next week thank you thanks sam bye-bye